Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you uh, this evening to the Baker Institute. Uh, I'm glad to see such a nice turnout that there are enough people who still believe in Arab-Israeli peace who uh, come tonight. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to have our two distinguished Baker Institute Middle East fellows, uh, Dr. Samuel Abid and Dr. Yair Hirschfeld, uh, with us uh, this evening. Uh, I have known both of them since the 1990s uh, when I was in government. Uh, in my eyes, they represent the very best in the Palestinian and Israeli society of individuals who are truly devoted uh, to seeking a just and secure Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace agreement. And they've worked virtually all their lives for this. Uh, Dr. Yair Hirschfeld uh, is the Baker Institute's uh, Isaac and Mildred Brockstein Fellow in Middle East Peace and Security uh, in honor of Yitzhak Rabin. He teaches at the University of Haifa in the Department of, uh, for Middle East and History. He's also the Director General of the Tel Aviv-based Economic Cooperation Foundation, the ECF, with which the Baker Institute has had a long uh, collaboration. Uh, in 1992, he created the Oslo Channel, Behind My Back. I was the Assistant Secretary of State uh, for Middle East Affairs in the State Department. He hates it when I tell the story. But uh, we knew that there was an academic and scholarly exchange between the Palestinians and the Israelis in uh, Oslo, in Norway. And uh, I had one of my key lieutenants, Dan Kurtzer, who later became ambassador to Egypt, ambassador to Israel. Uh, he was being briefed on these uh, scholarly exchanges. Uh, later on, we found out that these scholarly exchanges, instead of uh, Dr. Hirschfeld, the representative was Shimon Peres on the Israeli side, and then top Palestinians, and then uh, Warren Christopher, the Secretary of State at the time, was informed ex post facto that they had come to a deal. Uh, and I don't mind that, because the deal, if it can be done directly by the parties, God bless. It, it's really not a question who the author is. It's a question of getting the deed done. Uh, but. Uh, that was a very uh, uh, important uh, development that uh, Yair was a key architect of. He was, uh, 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 he prepared the first Israeli-Palestinian blueprint for the permanent status agreement, which later became known as the Bail and Abu Mazen understanding. So Yair has been involved uh, in peacemaking for much of his life. Uh, Dr. Samuel Abid, is the Baker Institute's Diana Tamari Sabah Fellow in Middle Eastern Studies. He uh, also heads the Palestinian Housing Council, a nonprofit institution that provides development plans, loans, and other forms of support to meet Palestinian housing needs in the West Bank, Gaza, and Jerusalem. Uh, previously, as head of the Committee for Borders and Territory, Sami was integrally involved in negotiations between Palestine and Israel. He was a key participant in the negotiations during the Camp David, Taba, and Annapolis processes in pursuit of peace and stability in the region. He was Minister of Public Works during the Palestinian Authority's National Unity Government in 2007 and Deputy Minister from 1995 until 2007. Uh, during a trip to the region in August 2009, when I met with uh, the Palestinian Authority President, Mohammed Mahmoud Abbas Abu Mazen, in his office in Ramallah. Uh, Samuel Abid was with me, and Abu Mazen pointed to him in front of me, and he said, this is my man on the territorial issues we're negotiating with between the Israelis. He is my expert. So after that, I treated him with much more respect. <laughs> uh, our work that both Yair and Sami uh, took the lead in culminated with the publication of this report that I think you have all have seen, uh, those of you who are affiliated with the Baker Institute, and this is a public report, 
this report uh, getting to the territorial endgame of an Israeli-Palestinian peace settlement was uh, uh, circulated on high. Personally, I took it to George Mitchell, uh, President Obama's uh, Middle East uh, envoy to Hillary Clinton, to the national security team in Washington, went to Jerusalem and gave it to Bibi Netanyahu's top advisors, uh, Uzi Arad and uh, others in the uh, Israeli National Security Council, then went to Ramallah and gave the report to Abu Mazen. And we have been promoting this report. Uh, George Mitchell told Secretary Baker uh, recently, about a month ago, that uh, he keeps this report on his desk because it's a very good track to uh, uh, analysis and policy recommendations on how to address the Israeli settlement issues, territorial land swap swaps, delineating the border between a future is uh, Palestinian state and Israel. So uh, these are the key people involved in uh, authoring this uh, report. Uh, so clearly, as recent, recent events have shown, uh, conflict resolution in the Middle East remains urgent and essential and frustrating. Uh, the recently announced unity pact between Fatah and Hamas poses some significant challenges and possible <coughs> opportunities. The key issue Israel, Palestine, and the international community, especially the U.S. now face, is how to move the Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations forward during this period of historic upheaval called the Arab Awakening. Our speakers this evening have much more to say on this and other related <coughs> subjects. And uh, 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 I think we will have an opportunity. Each one is going to make a uh, presentation, and then uh, they will sit at the table and answer whatever questions uh, you may have. So please join me in welcoming our speakers to the podium. The first one will be Samuel Abbott. Uh, welcome to the podium, Samuel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the Baker Institute for the opportunity to be here and present a concept paper jointly that uh, we developed by both Dr. Hirschfeld and myself. Both of us will be sharing some thoughts on how we believe a lasting Palestinian-Israeli peace can be achieved. As you all uh, aware, if things do not move forward, by negotiations by September, the PLO is determined to seek the admission of the State of Palestine as a full member of the UN. Already the State of Palestine has been recognized by 112 countries around the world, and more states have indicated they plan to follow uh, following suit. This decision by the, LO, by the PLO to go to the UN should be understood as a consequences of the deeply flawed Palestinian-Israeli peace negotiation <coughs> and peace process. It represents an attempt by the Palestinians to preserve to, and protect their right of self-determination and a state of their own alongside Israel on the 1967 border. We have entered the critical period in the region. Uh, history. The decision we make in coming months have drastic implications for the future. All of us with a stake in the region should examine closely, deliberately, and honestly the events of the past and those uh, before us today. The injustice Palestinians face should not be tolerated. Our people deserve dignity and freedom and I hope that for the, stake, for the sake of all Palestinians, Israelis, and the people of the Middle East, we achieve a lasting peace, and only a just peace is a lasting peace. I'd like to cover three areas here in the time that I have with you. First, I will discuss some of what I think are important lessons learned from past experience with Palestinian-Israeli negotiations. Second, I'll describe some of the current trends in the region that have bearing on the prospects of achieving comprehensive Palestinian-Israeli peace. 
Finally, I will describe some of the key components of a strategy that Dr. Hertzfeld and I proposed to get us to a final status agreement between Israel and Palestine. The first part, our experience and the lesson, lessons learned uh, uh, from the past. There are a number of important lessons that I took away from my experience with peace negotiations between Palestinians and Israelis. Of course, the heart of the problem lies in the massive power imbalance that exists between the two sides, the occupier and the occupied people. However, there are two important ways that this imbalance might have been dealt with. First, negotiations should have been opened up on a multilateral level rather than exclusively on a bilateral level. Second, during the interim, interim period, when the parties were negotiating final status issues, certain protections should have been put in a place to deal with the inherent problems in having an occupied people, on uh, the occupied people. Their freedom, uh, negotiate their freedom while still under military occupation. I will argue that this should have been dealt with by setting up an oversight mechanism and by agreeing on clear terms of reference from the outset. The bilateral versus the multilateral. Since the signing of Oslo agreement, Palestinians and Israelis, uh, Israeli negotiators were engaged in a bilateral process where mediators occasionally intervened to move the process along. However, this bilateral process was not effective for two reasons. First, certain parameter status issues like water rights and refugees, for example, cannot be dealt with comprehensively without the participation of other stakeholders in the region. Second, treating Palestinian Israeli uh, negotiations in isolation does little to mitigate the effects of the large power asymmetry between the two sides. When the Arab initiative of the two, uh, 2002 offered Israel normalization relations, if it concluded an agreement with the Palestinians based on the 1967 borders with a just resolution to the uh, Palestinian refugee plight based on UN Resolution 194, there should have been a concrete effort to bring in other regional players into the peace process to make a multilateral framework at that time. The carrot of Israel was enormous, full diplomatic relations, a peaceful Middle East, and open economic relations that would benefit Israeli development. It is not too late. With the help of the United States and the international community, the peace process can open up in a multilateral framework. And Dr. Hitchfield and I agree that this is just what should happen to get negotiations on the track. With recent development that uh, Hamas, now part of a unity government and, and, uh, uh, and uh, with agreement with Fatah, Israel now stands in the opposition of negotiations with one united Palestinian voice. Hamas has indicated that it will abide by any agreement approved by the Palestinian people in a referendum. So the time is now for negotiations. In the past, it was the United States that acted as a mediator between the parties. Unfortunately, what we have learned since the presidency of George Bush Sr is that the U.S. is unable to put pressure on Israel when necessary to move the process forward. On the Palestinian side, the U.S. today is not seen as a, a broker in the peace process. Going forward, I think the U.S. government should involve more of the major global powers and regional players in the peace process. By doing it, it can more effectively serve the cause of peace and the U.S. will not have to assume all the risks involved if the parties fail to reach an agreement. The second is putting the protections in place for the process to be uh, derailed. 
The interim period during which permanent status issues were supposed to be negotiated did not have any controls in place to enforce obligations during that period. Failure to have an oversight and enforcement mechanism resulted in the Palestinian side to uh, taking on the burdens of acting as service provider and police for Israel, the occupier, while it receives no guarantee that Israel would meet its obligation during the interim period. The absence of such a mechanism, of course, favored Israel, the stronger party, in that Israel could create facts on the ground in breaching international law and past agreements with impunity. If Palestinians failed to meet obligations, Israel could just revent back to its authority as occupier to obtain Palestinian compliance. Some examples of how, of how this action have been during the time the peace negotiations were ongoing, including the following. Israel doubled the number of settlers living in the occupied Palestinian territory. Second, Israel constructed a wall of separation deep inside the West Bank, which the World Court condemned as an attempt to de facto annex part of the West Bank to Israel. And third, Israel has attempted to alert the demographic makeup of East Jerusalem by revoking Palestinian residency rights there, demolishing homes, and evacuating Palestinian residency. So we see this happening in the Sheikh Jarrah area today and in Silwan as well in Jerusalem. One of the unintended consequences of the peace process was that it greatly reduced the cost of Israel to maintain its occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. The Palestinian National Authority assumed control over 85% of the uh, population who lived on only 15% of the land in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. During the peace process, and the Palestinian National Authority became responsible for the provision of municipal services and for internal law enforcement of the population with the help of international donors who funded development projects to build Palestinian capacity to provide services to the people. Israel was able to transfer the cost of its military occupation to the Palestinians. This removed an important incentive for Israel had to engage in talks with Palestinians and make a continuation of the status quo tenable for them. What was needed during the interim period was an oversight mechanism that could have ensured that Israel was performing its obligations as Palestinians were assumed theirs. Another serious flaw in the peace process was the term of reference concerning the substance of peace talks were not defined at the outset in the more recent uh, rounds. What happened during the Annapolis round, uh, talks that took place in 2008, shows you that what I mean if we look at how Israel dealt with the issues of borders. They argue that it did not clearly accept the 1967 border in the Oslo Accords as the basis for negotiations. Instead, Israel negotiators argued for a pragmatic solution based on current demographic realities. Of course, these realities, as I really referred to, were the facts on the ground that it has successfully established during the negotiation, which include new settlements construction, the wall and the land grabs in the West Bank, and especially in the East, in East Jerusalem. This, of course, make us now go back to the third issue that I would like to, uh, or the second issue that I would like to talk to you about, which is the current trends in the region. The Middle East today is witnessing significant change. First, the people of the Arab world are demanding government accountability and respect of their basic, basic rights and dignity. This is exactly what happened in Egypt, Tunisia, and now it's happening in Yemen, in Syria, everywhere in the Arab world. And most of those people are dealing with their new real dignity, real freedom, and real opportunity for the future. And this is exactly what the Palestinian people are looking forward to.
to have their dignity, to have their freedom, and to have their opportunity in the future, and to be a player in the, uh, uh, in the region. Without this, things will go in a different way. And I can assure you that the Palestinian people, they needed this more than anybody else in the region. Because freedom is something that we cannot tolerate forever. We have to have our freedom, and we cannot be under occupation forever. And we have to have our state, because our dignity within our state, and we cannot do not have it forever. Therefore, the, all the efforts should be made in order to get the Palestinians their right, their justice, and without real justice and fairness within that process, nothing will change in the area. There are changes in the region created <coughs> A space for reconciliation between uh, the two, uh, the Palestinian people, between Hamas and, and uh, uh, Fatah. But uh, strongly, it seems like uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel is opposed to this development. Before the unity government, Israeli claimed Palestinian division were the reason why it could not effectively negotiate with President Mahmoud Abbas. Now they argue that the unity government and the unity agreement is the reason Israel cannot negotiate with the Palestinians. And uh, unfortunately, you say, as if they're saying to us, uh, damn if you do and damn if you don't. Anyhow, uh, the third component that we leave that in the past behind us, and we have to start to think about what will be a successful strategy for us in order to move forward. This is what we can think are some of the important pieces of successful strategy for achieving comprehensive peace. First, any agreement must be just and fair if it is to endure. Principles of international law must govern any meaningful process. An agreement will be viewed as illegitimate to the Palestinians if not grounded in international law, and international law is a neutral arbiter for the dispute and provides clear standards. Second, a safety net are needed to protect Israelis and Palestinians from outbreaks of violence should the process fail to verge on failure. The situation on the ground today can easily spiral out of control. That is one of the reasons why we believe that the component of an initiative should be in the introduction of a peacemaking or a peacekeeping force and a robust multilateral presence on the ground. Third, the process should mitigate the effects of the power of asymmetry between the two sides. The end goal should be defined as a regional peace based on principle of international law in accordance with the Arab Peace Initiative. The reason for this is that an agreement that offers Israel a comprehensive peace and normalized relation with all Arab states after it concludes and uh, implement the terms of a final peace agreement with the Palestinians improves the chances of success by adjusting payoffs for Israel. Israel has an interest achieving normalization relationship with the Arab states. Fourth, in order to deal with the permanent status issues comprehensively, the negotiation framework should be opened up uh, and be a multilateral framework. Palestinian-Israeli bilateral negotiations are unlikely to succeed unless they are conducted in multilateral framework where also Syrian Israelis and Lebanese Israelis issues are also addressed. Having a multilateral framework also helps to soften the power asymmetry between Palestinians and Israelis. Fifth, to facilitate oversight during negotiations so that the parties stay in compliance uh, with their obligations during that period, certain international and national powers, uh, along with the U.S., should play key roles in driving the process forward. By involving a large number of international actors in the process, the process can make more momentum than it would if the United States mediate alone. Finally, an initiative needs to set our major milestones timelines and controls that give the process stability, direction, and legitimacy. In concluding, we say that the region needs an end conflict as it goes through the period of transformation. The global community 
should help set the region in the right direction and do what's necessary to achieve a comprehensive peace. Here in the United States, this will require that leaders and people with power think long and hard about the situation today and break away from a lot of uh, conventional thinking of past, uh, past times. President Obama called for the establishment of a Palestinian state in September. If there is no robust process established before, I think the U.S. should at least not oppose the state of Palestine's admission to the U.N. A resumption of negotiations must be serious and robust and not cosmetic. Its conclusion has to be an agreement that is just and fair. If we've learned anything from the past few months, it is that people's basic values and rights cannot be ignored without consequences. I think there is a real opportunity to move the region forward and achieve an end of the conflict. It can happen if there is the will. The U.S., along with other international partners, must take a leading role, but not at the expense of the process integrity. The cost of failure at this stage are very, very high. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Sammy. Now, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Yair Hirschfeld, uh, who will make his presentation. Dr. Hirschfeld. Good evening to everybody. Um, many thanks to Ambassador Jirjian for having us here. Many thanks for the wonderful staff of the Baker Institute, and thanks for you to coming to listen to us. Um, I, these are my glasses. These are not Samir Labet's glasses. So um, I'm not sure how my glasses read part of the speech he gave. <laughs> but um, uh, in any case, um, I will try to divide my remarks, and I'll try to be short, into um, four, four short remarks. Um, first, why we're at the crossroads, and being at the crossroads, we have made important headway in the process, in the historical process, to a two-state solution. Second, the dangers that we have to deal with today and tomorrow, particularly in the coming uh, short period. Um, third, the political reality, as much as I understand it in Washington, shortly in a little bit of what I know in Ramallah and in Jerusalem. And lastly, the opportunities, the way forward. If you listen to my um, my presentation, you'll find out that I'm copying the, the concept of the book of Ambassador Giorgiano, Opportunities and Dangers. So I'm going ahead on this line, and I hope you'll forgive me for doing this. Why are we at the crossroads? <coughs> Since Oslo, in, sp in spite of all the failures in negotiations and the sense of despair, we have made substantial headway. While um, when Chairman Arafat um, went, um, came, came to the White House lawn, and when we signed the Oslo Accords on the 13th of September 1993, the Palestinian ethos, the Palestinian ethos was built on two basic components, the right of resistance and the right of return. And um, in Oslo, they had to give up, on the paper at least, the right of resistance. Um, and um, he did not give up yet the right of return, but there was no state-building ethos. Um, the establishment of the Palestinian Authority, um, particularly the work since 2007 of Prime Minister Fayyad in, under the leadership of President Abbas, has created a real state-building state ethos on the Palestinian side. This has had another very important impact. While Arafat, did not want a unity, a monopoly of the use of force, but he had 10 security organizations in the West Bank and there are 10 security organizations in Gaza and one would play against the others, one would cooperate with Israel, the other would carry out some acts of violence. Um, under President Abbas and under Prime Minister Fayyad, 
There has been a commitment to non-violence. There has been a, a very effective manner to put, to create a Palestinian security force that will have a monopoly over the use of violence. And there's been very serious coordination and cooperation with the Israeli security forces in the West Bank, although the story in Gaza is different. And I would say this is a very, very great achievement. At the same time, as part of the Palestinian state building ethos, there's been very serious state building under the leadership of Salam Fayyad, and it is part of moving towards a two-state solution. On the Israeli side, we had the ethos of Eretz Israel Shlema, of Greater Israel, and um, when I in Oslo spoke about the possibility of a two-state solution, because anybody who reads the Camp David Accords of 1978 knows that in Camp David a two-state and Palestinian state was actually founded. I would take me a long time, some time to explain this to you why, but if you read the text you understand that. Um, but nobody in Israel spoke of a two-state solution in 1993 without a small group of academics, me and my assistant who were in Oslo. Um, and even Prime Minister Rabin and um, Minister of Foreign Affairs Paris did not. Today you have our Prime Minister, who is not exactly a left-wing guy, um, who in his bar speech, um, in his bar speech has committed himself to a two-state solution. Although yet not, has not yet developed a strategy how to get there, but on the ethos, on the concept of it, we've moved very seriously ahead on a two-state solution. Um, now, why are we at the crossroads? We're at the crossroads because um, of the Palestinian state building and security cooperation with Israel has re have reached a certain level where it has to go beyond that and going beyond that cannot be what we call the bottom-up state building, but there has to be part of the negotiations we have to move there. I'll be more specific. The Palestinian Authority control more or less, not completely, 40% of the West Bank territory. If we go to a two-state solution, what we are talking about is a two-state solution that will be based on the June 467 line. I'll come to it a little later. We will say, the Israeli government will say, we want to recognize realities on the ground in negotiations, which um, President Bush has granted to the State of Israel in his letter to Prime Minister Sharon of April 2004. Um, but we understand that the Palestinian side wants negotiations of the force of June 67 line, and negotiations will, there, will be there to define agreed swaps and agreed other exchanges that can bridge the gap between them. Um, but um, uh, actually, um, we have to go beyond the 40% very clearly, because 40% of the West Bank territory is not a Palestinian state. Let's be clear about that. Um, there's a second limit that we have to overcome. There, is, there are two and a half, 300,000 settlers in the West Bank today. And uh, we will negotiate, we will have to negotiate an agreement where maybe 60, 80, 100,000 settlers will have to leave their residences who've then gone there normally with the support of the Israeli government and have to be evacuated or relocated in another place, which is going to be a very tough thing. But without the removal of the settlements, there will not be a real, um, there will not be a real two-state solution, and we will not be really able to claim that Israel is the state of the Jewish people and Palestine is the state of the Palestinian people, which is a clear demand and the clear logic and the clear substance of a two-state solution. And we will also have to accept it, we have to, de um, to reach the acceptance of the Palestinian body politic, of the Arab body politic, that Israel is the state of the Jewish people, that we're there to stay, that our legacy is there, and that we come from there, and we have come back to our homeland, but it is our homeland. And we are not the outcome of any imperial or colonialistic development that has followed or kind of other colonialistic activities elsewhere. So we have to move to this passage, we are on this crossroads, and we have to go there. But going to this crossroads, I will tell you that there are many dangers ahead of us. There are very, very serious dangers ahead of us. The first danger, and let me, let me <coughs> line them out in, in quite some, one after the other. I don't know if you remember, but some two and a half or three weeks ago, a, a Hamas, the Hamas decided to shoot at a yellow school bus. Um, we were relatively lucky. 
If they would have shot the school bus five minutes uh, the school bus five minutes earlier, they would have killed 30 children. So they killed only one boy, only one boy. Um, and I can tell you that the Israeli um, government was very, very close, one, one centimeter, one inch away from moving into Gaza as in reaction against that, because the Hamas crossed the red line that you're not allowed to cross. And with the help of the um, UN envoy to the Middle East, um, Robert Seri, and a ceasefire with Hamas was negotiated. But, um, and there's now the hope that it can be, it can be stabilized. But the danger of, um, uh, of going back to the vicious circle of violence is clearly there and has to be taken account of. And what Israel will need in negotiations is a clear guarantee from the United States and the national community that, it can, that there will be a mixture of hard power and soft power to deal with such a danger if it occurs. The second danger is... Um, uh, led also very recently that the government of, Egy of Egypt decided to open, uh, open the border to Rafah, to Gaza. Um, we sent, the Israeli government sent our, um, one of our senior officials to Cairo and said, okay, if you open the border to Rafah, that's fine, but let's have clear security arrangements that the Hamas and uh, other, the Al-Qaeda, and all these wonderful organizations uh, won't be able to put in all kind of missiles and rockets that can kill hundreds and thousands of Israelis. We need this in order for our very existence. This is no joke. And the answer of the Egyptian, the immediate answer of the, is in the Egyptian counterpart to our senior was this is a unilateral Egyptian decision, this is a bilateral Egyptian Palestinian decision, this is none of Israel's bother. Which was, you know, if you go down that road, we are going into a vicious circle of violence. So um, what happened was relatively good. What happened was is that the United States has a variety of networks with the um, Egyptian military to say, you know, hold your horses, it can't be do so. And as a matter of fact, they did not open Rafah so far. I hope there will be security arrangements. I hope they will, be op they will open Rafah. But it has to go together with clear understandings how do you prevent, um, how do you prevent arms deliveries um, via from Hamas, via Sudan, or all these places into Gaza that can threaten Israeli children, women, and men and the civilian population that has been targeted in the last seven or eight years by Hamas guns. Um, the third danger is the, what we call the September trap. The third danger is the September trap. Um, it is not a small danger. Um, if if the, United, the Palestinian leadership goes ahead and announces that there w and goes to the General Assembly, says there will be a Palestinian state. It means that there's a denial of negotiations. It means there's a denial of negotiations. I have no doubt. I have no doubt. That I've going to go some something about the reality in Washington. I have no doubt that the um, um, in the Security Council, this will be vetoed by the United States. Without a Security Council decision, this General Assembly decision is of no legal value, and the, the situation on the ground will remain, remain the same, but it will enhance, quote-unquote, non-violent actions, and these non-violent actions have the tendency to move forward and to move forward towards violence. I can tell you that in 2001, um, we had the close cooperation with the governor of Jenin, and there was a demonstration, and we were on the phone, on the phone with the governor of Jenin to maintain it. This was already in the Intifada al Aqsa, and um, we, because there was cooperation on the security front, both sides lost control. Eight Palestinian security um, people were shot by our guys. I don't know who started it, and. Jenin turned from an area of coordination and cooperation into an area of violence against Israel. So um, from my point of view, we have to deal with this September thing and find a way that will take care of Palestinian dignity, that will take care of supporting Palestinian to, um, aspirations, that will lead the way to a two-state solution, but not by abrogating the chance of negotiations um, by a simply um, unilateral act that has very little practical 
impact rather than a demonstration that can be very destructive. I believe there is a fourth danger, um, and I'll be clear about the fourth danger. Um, although many of my, my friends who come from the same political camp as I do come from, do support that. A American peace proposal that will be outright rejected by the Israeli government can get us into a very different trajectory down the road towards violence. Um, and it has to be very well thought of what the American government does that um, we can, it can go along with and there will not be Israeli opposition to go down that line. It, um, I don't believe that Israel has to, that the United States has to accept everything our government says and does and thinks. By no means, no. And I clearly believe that the United States has to lead. But the United States has to have a clear understanding of where the sensitivities of Israeli society, how will Israeli society and Israeli body politic react to it, and the proposal that may, may be made by people who had the say and had the, majority of, had the majority of the Knesset 15 years ago but don't have it today can, will not necessarily lead us down the way we have to go to. So this is enough about the dangers. Let me get you more depressed by speaking about the political realities. Um, the political realities in Washington, as much as I see them, is that um, there are some good news and some bad news. Um, I, I'm, 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 I should not interfere in American things, but I have my opinion, so I'll, I'll, I'll state them quite clearly. Um, I believe that the, um, um, the uplift that President Obama has received by um, the action in Pakistan um, taking Osama bin Laden to where he belongs to um, uh, has been uh, has given him a very, very important uplift um, and has given, and has been, I believe, far more important, um, far reaching than, than at first sight can be seen. Um, but clearly, in the mind of the people around the president, the 2012 elections are very much on the top of their mind. And in the um, moving ahead on the 2012 elections, the situation is that some of the key states. The key states um, President Obama may lose in the November 2012 elections. In these, ele in these states, the Jewish vote of is, is, is of great importance. And some of the Jewish vote um, have to be told that President Obama has been born in Hawaii and not elsewhere. And um, um, he will have, there will be a need to, to live up um, to realities on this kind too. Um, but I have no doubt that President, uh, President Obama will be very, very careful. We had a, um, a meeting before with uh, Secretary Baker, and he said that any government has to take a strong position on principles, and the principles definitely will have to be not unilateral action, but go for negotiations. Um, but even if President Obama will have to face difficulties in the Congress, we hope we will move ahead on it, but it's not going to be an easy, an easy move ahead. Um, and now, a second difficulty reality in Washington is that for my, as much as I understand, there's a bipartisan view in, uh, over the aisle, um, in, um, over the aisle in, in the Congress and in the Senate, um, that the Hamas is a terror organization, and um, that um, um, they've killed Americans. The um, Palestinian Prime Minister um, in Gaza, uh, who will not be any more Prime Minister, and maybe for this reason he did this to undermine the process, but he said that um, Mr. Obama, Mr. Osama bin Laden was a holy guy. Um, doesn't make it easy in Congress to um, take an action in support of the present of the unity thing in there, and there's strong bipartisan opposition against that. That will have to be dealt with one way or the other. Um, there is also the Osama bin Laden effect on Pakistan. I don't have to tell you um, that on Pakistan um, there is a discussion in the United States um, that you can't give. 
$20 billion to a state that afterwards plays a double game. And there will be the demand, well, this is true for Pakistan, this will be true for Palestine. And you will, there will be a demand on the Palestinian side that there won't be a double game on the Palestinian side. And you definitely will have the Israeli government to support this kind of approach, mm -hmm. which I believe is necessary. It has to be necessary, has to be done in a way that can just move us ahead and doesn't move us down the road into bad situation. We've, in the last, two, uh, today I've heard a lot about, in, about the, the political situation in Ramallah. And the political situation in Ramallah, I understand, is um, um, characterized by three components. Component number one, that there was a strong demand of the people, of the young people, of the Arab, Arab Spring people on the Palestinian side to go for unity between Fatah and Hamas. And I think it's an important component in any strategic consideration. <coughs> um, there was, um, there is a second understanding um, that um, this deal may not be for always, but um, it, um, uh, that, that Abbas didn't get really substantial quid pro quos for, for some of his measures that were very, very constructive. And that he needs some kind of positive understanding where he's going to go ahead. And therefore, without that, without getting some understandings how to move ahead, it would be very difficult for him to agree to something that is constructive. And there's the third, comp third part in Ramallah that um, President Abbas was supported before the Arab Spring in Egypt by the Egyptian government um, and by the other parts of the Arab world. This Arab support has been not as so secure as it was before, and he will have to get the support not only from himself, not only, he cannot go alone to negotiations, but he needs some kind of support, as um, has been pointed out. In Jerusalem, the reality is not as bad as one tends to believe, also maybe not very beautiful, but it, there are two sides to it. Two sides to the, reality, the political reality in Jerusalem are as follows. The, um, the Israeli security system has asked Prime Minister Netanyahu and has told him, you spoke about in your bar speech about the two-state solution. Give us a strategy, a trajectory, how do you want to get there? I don't know if you, if you are clear what this means, but this is a clear, a clear statement of the Israeli security, security structure to say, for heaven's sake, Prime Minister, go ahead, f say how you want to go to two-state solution, but move in that direction. It is a little bit beyond what is normally done. It is normally the security forces don't take such a role. Um, there's a second factor which is quite positive. You have, um, you have what, we, what the Likud called the Lieberman factor. The Lieberman factor is that Lieberman has accused Netanyahu of being a traitor to the right wing, being what he called a Feinschmecker. Feinschmecker, he doesn't really doesn't really fight for right-wing things. And Netanyahu is caught for the next elections between the threat that Lieberman will take away his right-wing votes and Tsipi Livni, Kadima, will take away his left-wing votes, his left -wing, the, the left-wing, the formerly good votes. What he can go for, what he can go for, he can go for getting the Kadima, uh, Kadima is an, is an comes from, sprang out of Likud. In Kadima, if he goes for a peace initiative, he, will, he has big, big chances of getting big parts of Kadima back into the Likud and going to elections and winning them. As he always can say, I'm the only one who can deliver peace, and there's a little bit of truth in it. And, um, but he has to do it. So there is pressure on Netanyahu to move ahead. There's the opposite pressure. There's the opposite pressure that he, without Lieberman, he may not have a government. And without the settlers' movement, he may not have a supportive structure for going to elections. He may have a lot of opposition in that side. So he's to make a decision. But there is pressure to go into the right direction. In my sense, if there's a leading American role in saying, oh no, 
Mr. Prime Minister, we want to move ahead. Last July, last July, two, in 2010, Prime Minister, you have made promises to President Obama, and President Obama can tell you. Let's look how these promises can be turned into reality. I believe we have a really, real chance of moving ahead. Now, let me be very short on the opportunities because I don't want to talk too long and leave time for it. But we are speaking about two major understandings. We are speaking about um, an understanding that in moving, on, moving to negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians, we, need, we will have to negotiate five issues. Guidelines for the core issues to get to permanent status agreement. The second, a um, Palestinian state building, how to widen the 40% to 60 70% while negotiating and coming to the final border. Third, security arrangements to prevent spoil and terror action while negotiations are going on. Fourth, assurances that we get to the end game to a per permanent status agreement. And fifth, an international structure. On the international structure, we have a lot of ideas and we're working on that. And we hope that this can be quite useful. A lot has been done on the international structure in this house 20 years ago. Maybe this is one direction, maybe the other directions. But um, we believe to let me end this by saying that negotiations tend to be successful under two conditions. Either if there's a lot of, there's a win-win that both sides want to move there, or there's a dramatic lose-lose that both sides are afraid of it. We're in the second, oh, we, are, we are in the second phase. There's a dramatic lose-lose if we don't go ahead. So I hope we'll have the rationality to take this chance and make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jair. Uh, the floor is now uh, open to uh, questions and discussion. If you would uh, raise your hand, introduce yourself. I don't know if we have microphones. Uh. Yes, Max. Be prepared. <laughs> Max Wagner. Thank you for this. Uh, you know, for bringing to. Uh, two very excellent uh, academicians here for this discussion. And uh, as, as you uh, said in your introduction, uh, they play a big, academicians play a big role in the process. And uh, academicians are opinion makers also in the end. So my question is the following. We heard from the Israeli academician a sort of a balanced position with the good things with the bad things that could come out of Israel. And uh, on the other hand, when we hear from uh, the Arab academicians, we only hear one straight narrative without saying the bad things that happen on their side, without saying this is what we also should perhaps do in order to put the two sides together. Why is it that we always see this unbalance between the Israeli narrative and the Palestinian narrative? have a supporter. Thank you. It's uh, very, very simple. We are, uh, we are the under occupation. They are the occupier. And they are uh, mainly wanted to find a solution on our territory, not in their territory. And that's why when we present our case, we said we wanted our state, we want our freedom and our dignity. And I don't see anything wrong with that. Having, and we have nothing else to say, except this is our demands, this is our needs. So in order to get there, there is one simple thing that needs to be done, is to end the occupation. And after that, anything can be talked between us and the Israelis in a normal situation between two states, between two neighbors, and we can argue with all the issues that happens in your mind. But what I heard from uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Hirschfeld today, something even more than uh, uh, the, the uh, what needs to happen here and there. But it was a clear uh, message which is in our mind most of the time that the Israelis will tell the, any American administration what to do. And, uh, uh, you know, they've been asking what that the uh, administration will do here and will do there. 
for the interest of, the, of uh, Israel, of course, uh, without even bothering with the interest of the uh, American in the Middle East as a whole. What we are witnessing now is something different. It's not the regimes who will dictate what will happen in that area. It's the voice of the people who are now dictating what will any government in the Middle East will do. And that is a big change. We have to think about this very seriously. And we have to think, and the Americans have to think also very seriously for their uh, interest in, in that region, as well as the Israelis. They have to be very, very interested in knowing exactly what needs to be done in order to be part of that region. There. Yeah, yeah you're short. I will show the answer. Um, th there's a difference between Israeli society and Palestinian. We are a very open society. The truth is that um, this may change now, but the truth is if we speak not in front of the public and on the website, we do get these things from the Palestinian side that you're talking about. So we, if, we have a, if we've got a very honest and open dialogue, it's a two-way road. Yes, sir. Well, I, you know, I have some observation on the story, and, and I, I, I'm not but, but please ask a question. Uh, yeah, please, a question. But, but not too long. You know, uh, not too long. Uh, you know, I just observed that you, you guys were sitting there in three chairs, and you were sharing the chairs. So I think there is a chance for multilateral and unilateral. Uh, you know, the American was sitting there, uh, the Israeli got him, uh, the Palestinian took his share. So there is a possibility. But, uh, and you know, obviously, ultimately, you're sitting there, so it has to be multilateral. But you know, I have a story, uh, in 1976, I had a friend from Palestine. And this answers uh, the, uh, the Dr. Sami's question. And in 1976, he was so angry. I met him in India, and he said that, the Israelis have ruined us. In 19, uh, 2011, a friend of mine uh, took two children to Palestine to visit, and they went through a ton of, you know, roadblocks. Now, that's 30 years. And what I'm, I'm just hearing this thing about, oh, you know, we've got clapping going on, and we've got all this. I think there has to be a solution. And I think you're right. Uh, you know, the fact that a ch child was shot in a yellow cab, a yellow bus, let's have a, a Palestine child shot, or let's have these eight Israeli soldiers shot, and let's see what the solution is. Thank you. I'm not sure what the question is. Okay, well, no question. Okay, any other uh, questions? Y yes, sir. Uh, could you identify yourselves when you, thank you. Please. My name is Uri Bianca. I would like to ask how you can reconcile negotiating uh, with Fatah, with the West Bank uh, people, uh, Abbas and Israelis, when you make uh, an agreement with Hamas that wants to erase Israel. The, there is no basis for negotiations anymore. That's it. How can you reconcile? <laughs> yeah, that, uh, I wanted to say yeah. well, the peace process started when uh, uh, the whole Palestinian people were engaged in this in Gaza and in the West Bank. And um, you know, we all know that when Hamas came out there, because for two reasons: one, they became stronger because nothing happened in the peace process to get the inspiration of the Palestinian people to be there. But they killed the people, so many of them. They were fine, okay. This happened, I mean, uh, uh, in, in, uh, civil war was here in the state before the state was established here. And both the south and the north, they shoot at each other and killed each other. But at the end, you know, they conciled with each other and became one state and the strongest state in, in, on earth so far. So maybe this will happen to us. I mean, we, we don't have any problem between us and the people in Gaza. We have with some faction of the PLO that uh, uh, it can be, if there is a solution, a peaceful sol a solution between us and the Israelis, I don't see any reason why anybody from Gaza or from the West Bank would like to erase the state of Israel. If we have, if we have peace and we can deal with each other as two states, 
uh, neighbors, uh, uh, everybody have his dignity and have his uh, uh, freedom. And uh, as if you're saying to us, we, you're denying our existence by keeping the occupation there. It is the fundamental issue that we have to end the occupation. Dignity and freedom means the end of occupation. If you don't have occupation, I don't see any reason why anybody will shoot at the Israelis or wanted to erase Israelis. If you have an agreement with with uh, in, in, uh, with both of us, and uh, but if you want everything to happen and you want us all to, to remain under occupation, build settlement, take our resources in, in water. You know, you, we drink less than the settlers are drinking. Well, and uh, uh, yes, Sorry. the question is. You know, related for all. Change its position. All of of course, of course. I mean, what we heard from uh, Mashal uh, uh, lately, he said that he would like to see a Palestinian state on the on the West Bank and Gaza. This is what he said. <laughs> so give him a chance. These people, if you can get a real <coughs> process for giving the Palestinian people their aspiration, then things will differ. Things will matter. And you have uh, radicals in, in the Israelis as well. And you know, they want those who want from the Israeli side for transfer of the Palestinians. I mean, do you don't consider that? What doesn't matter to you? Doesn't matter to you? It matter it, it no. matter to us. No, no, it it's matters. the same the same thing. It's, it's the other it is the uh, uh, both side of the coin. They want to transfer us from there and they will return somebody they don't want to see you there. But the fact of the matter, if we have a real peace agreement between the two, and you have a just and fair for the Palestinian people there, I don't see any reason for both of those radicals even to be there. Uh, I, I will now uh, answer you shortly. Uh, um, if we want an international umbrella, um, the international position has been of the quartet powers, by the way, i um, repeat it now, that the international umbrella has to be based on the three quartet conditions, recognizing the right of existence of the State of Israel, um, and, um, being committed to agreements, and being committed to non-violence. If the Hamas join the negotiations under this, good. If they don't join the Ham negotiations on this, then President Abbas comes also good. So there's no real put, there's no real difficulty to move forward to its negotiations and uh, in, in in this condition. So you, you must in negotiations you state certain conditions and you move ahead on that. And I'm quite confident that we can move ahead on this way. To negate the other position, to say we cannot negotiate, we want to maintain the status quo as it is, is from an Israeli point of view, and that will take me more time to make this clear to you, is from an Israeli point of view a policy of, um, of suicide. Of strategic suicide. If you want, if you want uh, Israel to be the state of the Jewish people, you do not want to have a situation where there are 5 million Palestinians and 6 million Jews in the area of 27,000 square kilometers. You don't want to go there. You want to change the situation on the ground. And if you keep this going on the status quo, God help us, you and me together. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is Young. Um, it has been suggested that the uh, this reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas is motivated by a double fear that uh, uh, Fatah fears loss of support from a shaky Egypt and, and Hamas likewise fears that they may lose their support from uh, what's going on in Syria as a surrogate maybe for Iran. Do you think it's even remotely possible that the Palestinian question may disappear from the agenda of other Arab states in the in the area that the Palestinians in the end will be on their own in these negotiations? Short answer is no. No. Short answer is absolutely no. Let's, go, let's look at it. <coughs> if, if there's no headway in negotiations, we are going down to a line of, of violence. If we go, let's say there's th there are peaceful demonstrations. These peaceful, 20,000 Palestinians march on Jerusalem. And somebody starts to shoot. And we kill eight or 10 people. We, Israel becomes more and more Libya, and they're more and more seen as a, as a kind of Gaddafi. If we want it or we don't want it. So we have, there is a necessity, that, and the Arab, this goes to Al Arabiya, this goes to Al Jazeera, this goes to every, the, all of the Arab world. 
So we don't want to be blackmailed by the Palestinians on this. We will not accept the blackmail. So if they want to go to violence, in the end we will go to violence. But we have to make it clear that we're willing to negotiate and we're willing to go down the line to make a real, a fair two-state solution work that will give dignity to them and will give dignity to us. We'll recognize their legitimate rights, we'll recognize our legitimate rights. Otherwise, it's not going to go on. Um, Steve, um, uh, given the ground, I was glad to hear about the groundswell of support uh, from Palestinian youth kind of forcing Abu Mazen into the position of negotiating with Hamas. Given the fact that Syria and Iran and Hezbollah have so much influence in Gaza, though, do you ever see a groundswell of being even allowed of a youthful Arab Spring going on in Gaza? Well, the Arab Spring, we want to utilize it as part of encouraging the, uh, uh, the voice of the people by, and I think that was the main reason why the, the conciliation between Fatah and Hamas started, not because of afraid of Egypt, in the contrary, I mean, the position of the Egyptian government now is stronger with the Palestinians than it was before. And uh, uh, we feel that because of the voice of the people, in Ramallah and in Gaza for this conciliation. I think both of them, they got in a hurry in order to get uh, a deal is done. In addition to that, what happened in Syria and what is happening in other Arab world also make it much easier for both of them to get to, together because they know that they have one destination, both one people with one country. And uh, this for, for us is moving even more stronger than before, that now people's voice is coming toward an end the occupation. The voice of the people are moving more and more toward end the occupation, but not to go to war with Israel. And they want to do it peacefully. I want to do it in the right direction like others. And the voice of the, the people now what is happening in the Arab world is much stronger than any military forces in the, in the region. The voice of the people, it's now stronger than any military establishment in any of the countries in the region. And therefore, we, the Palestinians, not anymore afraid of the uh, military establishment of the Israelis. I mean, we've been trying this for many years, okay? We want very simple thing that I hope keep, you know, repeating that. We want to end the occupation. We want to be free like any other people in the whole world. We want to have our dignity. We have to have our opportunity for the future. We cannot live under this occupation forever. And I don't see any reason why you want your grandchildren to live in a situation like this while we want the best for our grandchildren as well. Why we make all that story about what is happening between Hamas and, and Fatah and others. This is a result of unfairness and injustice. If you have the fairness and if you have the justice, then all this should dis disappear and everybody will work against it in order to make it to disappear. For those who want to spoil this type of things, all of us will stand against it. But unless this has happened, I mean, you cannot, you cannot make sure that uh, uh, any other organization will take this. Yes, we have organization in Gaza that we, the Palestinians, we don't like. We have the uh, Salafis there, and we don't know which, uh, what their direction, whether they link to the Al Qaeda or others. But we want to fight them. We don't want to be in that in that boat. But give us a chance in order to tell people that there is a, no need for violence in that area, which is not free the people have them have a good future. Otherwise, yes, th other things can happen. And uh, uh, if we do not get the chance soon, uh, you know, we're not very uh, optimistic about uh, if no changes will take place, that things will be the, uh, the right thing that we would like to see. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> my, my name is Milton Banyak, and um, you know, you talk about agreements, but, um, uh, you know, how can Israel trust agreements when they've been so marginalized 
by every country in the world, by the UN, the only country that has been criticized of violating human rights, when <laughs> human rights violation is so prevalent throughout the world. The Goldstone Report, yeah, I mean, it, it's only the UN, the US vote in the Security Council that would protect Israel from you know, uh, being marginalized. So if they have a peace agreement, what can Israel do if the terrorist attacks and suicide bombers begin? I'd like to ask both of you what you think can be done to prevent that from happening in the future, and particularly in view of what's happened to the Jews throughout world history. They've been persecuted in every country in the world. They now have a home, a homeland, and they're committed to protecting themselves. So please answer that question. I will um, um, uh, let me give you two or three different components of the answer. We have experienced, does it hear me? Um, we have experienced three models of dealing with security. Um, model number one is full occupation. Um, and in order to do this, you drive the Palestinian population against you, you drive them in the hands of the radicals, it's a disaster. It in, may help you in the short run, in the medium and long run, it's a security disaster for Israel, because there are limits what you can do with the army. There's the second model that we moved out of Gaza, and um, they sent 7,000 rockets into Israel. And there's a third model. There's a third model that we developed in the last four years um, with the help of General Jones and General Dayton um, and under the leadership of President Abbas and Salam Fayyad, um, which our Chief of Staff, Gabi Ashkenazi, who is not anymore Chief of Staff, but our former Chief of Staff, has said, we do, they do more, we do less. They do more, there is, the Palestinian security forces are united the Palestinian security forces coordinate with Israel very effectively, very quietly, but very effectively. And if we move towards a two-state solution, the two-state solution means that they do more, we do less. I can go into details what it means, but we don't have enough time. Um, but as we cover together, there has to be an ongoing fight, what the Americans call cutting the grass against the terrorists. And cutting the grass against the terrorists, they cover about 70%, we cover about 30%. And we can change this more and more, that they can, but it has to be some kind of coordinated thing. <coughs> now, moving towards a peace agreement, we have to have security understandings, what happens during negotiations and what happens thereafter. And we have very detailed understandings what is necessary to do that. It means that Israel has to have to comp the, the, uh, you need, in order to maintain security, you need what you call hard power and soft power. Soft power is that you build regional coalitions with other, other with the Palestinians, with Jordanians, with Egyptians, with the Saudis, with others, in order to go against the, the um, smuggling of weapons, against incitement, against all these things. We're starting to, this is partly happening, it has to be expanded. Um, and you have soft power understandings also with, um, with the international community. You will have to have hard power understandings if they hit all together, you hit it very, very strongly and you have to, Israel maintains the right to self-defense, fully the right to self-defense. And it may not be possible, I don't believe that soft power alone can do it, I believe that you need the hard power. But all this, you, if you put together, if you have an agreement, yeah, what you move is you move strongly from from how the only use of soft power of hard power with no soft power to more and more use of soft power, more and more effective use of soft power, and less less the necessity to use your hard power. And then we will have to have guarantees for all kind of other guys like Iran and things like this. And we're negotiating with the United States. But I can tell you that in July 2010. Prime Minister Netanyahu discussed this with President Obama, and President Obama immediately, immediately delivered on all his promises immediately did, not necessarily his counterpart. Yes. 
Levi Eileen. There's a book 20 plus years ago, <coughs> from Beirut to Jerusalem. My impression of that book was there'll never be peace in the Middle East. Have things really changed from that? You know, journalists are superficial guys. If I have the depth of analytical understanding as Tom Friedman, then Becker kick me out of university. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know, we have made progress. I, I've used this anecdote before, if you allow me. A lot of people ask me, has U.S. policy evolved in the Middle East, and especially on the Arab-Israeli issue? I go, well, when you look back, when the first Arab-Israeli war broke out in 1948, our representative of the United Nations was uh, Ambassador Warren Austin. And he made a statement in the United Nations Security Council, and you could check this out, it's in the public record. He said, it's the position of my government, the position of the United States of America, that we are going to bring the Jews and the Arabs together to make peace in a good Christian manner. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is on a historic record. And if you ask me, have we made some progress in understanding the cultural complexities of this issue? Yes, we have. But we still have a long way to go. Please, next question. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Richard Vaughn, um, Dr. Olivet, uh, you mentioned a couple of times that you thought there should be other partners um, than just the United States involved in the peace process. Who should those partners be? Well, as you all know that the Europeans are uh, paying the price of the occupation. You know, they are supporting us uh, financially. And also some of the Arab countries are uh, supporting that. For, in order to support this, the state building, in a good manner, we need them to be involved with the process as well. And uh, to be honest, uh, with the United States alone, we feel that they are biased toward the Israelis more than us. And what we need, we need a fair and uh, just uh, uh, <coughs> partner to be in the process. By introducing international community to us, is uh, uh, some sort of a guarantee that at least we can get some fairness in the process. So far, we did not get that fairness. And we want to see others involved in any other matters, because uh, there are also certain issues that need to be involved more than the United States, and not to put all the burden in the United States. For example, uh, state building. Second, the issue of the refugees. If we can get to some sort of compensation for the refugees, then, then there is a support needed for from others as well. <clears throat> That's why we wanted the international community to uh, to be there. They have responsibility toward the issue, and they should be involved. Uh, that's the reason why we want them to be there. And, uh, it's already the quartet there, but did not have uh, enough. We want the Arab countries to be involved with the quartet as well and to have a better uh, uh, say in the process as a whole. I have just one last question, lady yeah. here. Lady Chandler, you just mentioned ref compensation for refugees. Does that apply equally to those 800,000 Jews who were forced out of Arab countries in 1948? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is the case. I mean, why not? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but give give the right for the refugees to go back to their homelands as well. You know, I don't think it has to be reciprocal. Yeah, it has to be reciprocal for both. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Uh, I join in applauding our two uh, uh, representatives. Thank you very much for coming. Hmm? I didn't let your niece ask a question. I wanted to ask a question, but you can ask him a question. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>